Krishna Rajan is a distinguished professor at the University at Buffalo and you know, has a long track record of uh, materials design driven by data science approaches. And um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's great you are here with us today and we can learn from your talk. <laughs> thank you. Um, well, thank you, Hendrik. I, I really appreciate the chance to talk to see everyone and get to know everyone here. Um, I, I'm going to use uh, today's talk to um, talk about uh, not you know different ways of looking at how data and material science question or issues can be married, and I guess the the punchline really is um, not so, so much generating data and looking at the existing data, but how can we use existing data and try to figure out what the next step should be. And I guess that's really the the message I'm trying to get across. So uh, depending on the time, I have um, a variety of examples in different in different areas. Now, not everything we're doing, but I just thought I'll pick two or three, including uh, some on the uh, materials characterization side. So data isn't just from the modeling, but also characterization. So that's that's my <laughs> the overview of my talk. Um, just as a bit of background, um, um, I'm at the University of Buffalo, and I just want to, as I know there's a lot of text here, but I just want to, I use this as an introductory slide, just as a bit of background, which I think is very relevant to uh, your center as well, uh, which is, that uh, five years ago, I was asked to come, I, in Buffalo invited me to come there to actually start a department from scratch, which is, in, as you can well imagine, in academia is a very unusual opportunity. And um, in other words, we, we hire everyone from the outside, we build a department physically, uh, both in, physically and intellectually from the, from, the, from the ground up. And so I came in 2015 um, and um, uh, so for the first year, I always joke, I, I was a department head with no faculties, which is an interesting experience. But we then in the next, within the next two years, we, we hired uh, a whole set of faculty in different fields. And the whole, and the, but the key issue was the entire department, uh, both in terms of people, uh, curriculum, um, everything was, I, I organized it in the context of data-driven science. So uh, rather than saying we do material science and then we go, uh, find computer scientists to work with, or we ship our students to someone else to turn tools. Uh, how do we re-examine material science from the beginning um, from a data science or uh, an information science perspective? I don't like, I always like to use information science because data by itself is not information. So uh, this is maybe the subject of another conversation about uh, education and how we do things, but um, th this is what we've managed to achieve. So now we've got over uh, a full-scale master's and PhD program. Our first PhDs were produced, graduated this year, in fact, and we have about 50 people who graduated already, and then uh, we have about 30 or 40, 30 to 40 graduate students right now, both masters and PhDs, um, and uh, our undergraduate program starts um, uh, this this fall, which would be, and that was another entire curriculum we built from scratch. Uh, entirely from the data science perspective. And, uh, and also we've introduced uh, something which might be real interest to all of you is that we've developed the first joint uh, chemistry materials degree program uh, at, at, at UB where students enter the university at the undergraduate level in chemistry and they get accelerated and then they join our department uh, to get a master's. So, uh, so, what, so in the last five years, uh, or actually four years now, we've gone from literally zero to a very, very sizable department and uh, in many, many areas. So I just wanted to give you a bit of background and I think it's relevant to this issue. Um, these are the, the core faculty I have and I'm very lucky that we have a very diverse set of folks from all kinds of fields. And what's interesting about our department is that very few of us actually have degrees in material science. Most of us, are, most of, I'm more, probably one of the few. Um, everyone in this department uh, either uh, is, is doing experimental work is roughly divided for experimental and computational and uh, and covering everything from struct people with PhDs in structural biology. We have people whose PhDs in, in statistical, in statistics. We have people with PhDs in computer science, but all those people were people who got out of their fields and moved into another related field. So we, we teach everything together and we have a very exciting opportunity. And I just put out there, we are in the market to get more faculty um, in the department. And if you know good people, especially and that helped promote diversity. Uh, there's some exciting opportunities uh, that we would like to 
that, that are available for us to make the department grow bigger. Uh, so I uh, just want to give you that background. Okay, so let me just begin um, with, with you know, how, where to start. And I think the, the concept of data and, and, and the need for data, and, I, and, and since your center has the phrase multi-scale, I just thought I'd like to kind of go around the circle here and, 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 and look at how we, where the multi-scale component comes in from my perspective. So this is from an article I wrote some years ago about um, that the concept of data and, and, you know, and, the, and the, the lexicon, when I first started working in this, we didn't have a term informatics. We didn't have, in fact, it's interesting. When I wrote my first proposal to NSF, um, <laughs> quite a long time ago in this field, the reviewers came back and said, why do we even worry about data-driven material science? And they was like, if you want to solve a problem, go model it, do simulations, do experiments. But the concept of data as a foundation was very alien. And um, obviously things have changed, but it was a very long slog in the very early stages of this business to, to convince people of its value. So I'm very happy to see folks like you doing very exciting work. But the concept of data, I think, is, is, is not, we always think of volume as a kind of foundational issue, and having some to begin with is, is key, but you, you don't, we cannot do common control experiments, everything, we can't compute everything in massive scales for every topic, and, uh, and I'm a material scientist, and just for a bit of background, I'm actually an electron microscopist by training, and uh, I, when I say, and I look at defects, and I, my training was in understanding uh, one defect at a time, and, and the question always is, how do you can't do that genre of work and necessarily scale everything up, so you piece the information together across length scales, sometimes quantitatively, sometimes heuristically. So there are other metrics associated with data. So that is the veracity, which is the uncertainty component uh, that can range from reference data, which is the data that we really trust and believe in to generating lots of our data uh, at very high speed. Uh, you have the speed at which there's the velocity component that could be both in a streaming sense, but also the rate at which data is collected with respect to another variable. It could be pressure, temperature, whatever. And finally, the variety of data. And the data uh, we can, we this, the material science community has done a great job, especially in the data-driven field, connecting the volume and single or double scale <laughs> metrics of, of data. But when, if you want to get to the multi-scale information, it gets more complex. And, is, and uh, so my art, the, 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 the thrust of my, our research in, in my group and the way we approached it from the beginning is, uh, I've always had little data. That's the irony of it. If I, in fact, I always like to point out that my very, very, very first talk I was ever invited to give a talk on data-driven material science. I, I still remember the title of my talk is "How do you discover How do you discover materials with very little data?" Because that was the practical reality. And so, when people talk about data being sparse and uneven, um, of course, it's sparse and uneven. And my argument is, our, our entire research in my group over the years has been uh, working with tools such that uh, we don't necessarily have that amount, and how do we still solve problems? So, um, so here's the deal. This I always like to kind of point out that you know the volume aspect is something we we always deal with, but the real issue we want to deal with is connections. How do we build connections? And the reason I say that is, and I I use this example from um, the cell phone connection component, uh, and it, it's an article which, which I took from the New York Times many years ago, um, where the the idea of how to map out the relationships between the frequency of connections, where you build connections, where you is really based on how the data flows and discovering the flow of data and, and, and how that, and then the, the flow of data has a lot to do with uh, a whole series of metrics. So I look at this, uh, this analogy and the metaphor in, in the telecommunications aspect example as the, the, as the materials example as well. So if you look at the, the map, in this case being geographical, but in our case being a materials map where you have multiple cases of properties and processing and, and, and different length scales of information, not all the information connects to an end process or end property in, in an easy way. In some cases, that connections are weak. In some cases, they're strong. In some cases, they involve a very convoluted path. If you discover what those are, then you can truly discover and accelerate uh, the discovery of new materials and new processes. So, uh, and, and in fact, the mathematics underlying telecommunications uh, in information theory actually has been 
the kind of the, the motivating force or the guiding force for almost my entire research group over the last 25 years is and 30 years is to say, how do we bring not so much, yes, we can accelerate this with machine learning and computers and, and, and software, but the fundamental foundational issue is statistics and information theory. And that to me is really what drives us for every problem we look at. So, um, so having said that, I just want to, for today's talk, I just want to um, uh, cover a few areas and, and I'm going to give some examples on, uh, which is uh, the different ways we can map information. And, and, and a lot of this is things we have always been doing in material science, but I always like to point out that the informatics concept has been embedded in our lexicon, although we never really called it that. And um, I'll give some examples. And to me, one of the big issues is that I used for today's talk is uh, what in, core, in formal term, data dimensionality reduction, which is um, it's, it's not so much the data itself, but how the, the potential numbers of correlations and things which uh, exist between different genres of information data that can help us figure out what to do next. And I'll give a few examples of applications, which I hope might be of interest to, to the group today. Um, up the, you know, up the usual formal uh, acknowledgements, and this we've been supported by various groups over the years. Uh, more recently, we've just been uh, part of this uh, DIBS program where we talked about where we called the Data Laboratory for Materials Engineering, uh, which is really focused not so much on building databases, uh, but more about um, what are the tools we need to build connections. So how do you actually solve an engineering problem to solve an engineering problem requires different types of ways of gluing together, uh, not just databases, but the, the tools that to make them. And so that's what that program is. And that has given us a lot of opportunity to look at different applications. So to start off with, let me just talk about the mapping concept. And I just like to, uh, for those of you that, you know, this is what we teach undergraduate material science students all the time. But I, I think the point that I'll first of all want to make is uh, the, 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 the diagrams refer to what we call our structure maps, which is mapping uh, apparent relationships empirically between certain genres of crystal chemistry uh, to some metrics or parameters. So if I take the, the one in the middle, the Moser Pearson uh, plot, for example, um, the, the idea here, let me just make sure I, not the pointer shows up. Uh, it, it, it says you have some sort of classification between zinc blend, wurtzite, sodium chloride, cesium chloride type structures, and you can draw some sort of boundary which says if you plot this thing called principal quantum number against electronegativity, what, what this uh, map that Moser and Pearson proposed was that you were able to self-assemble and organize the data into these groups. So um, in, in the data mining or computer science jargon, this is a classification map. Uh, you can, and, and these boundaries can be, are done empirically, although we can do it in a much more mathematical way using machine learning techniques ranging from support vector machines and regressions and so on. But it's just interesting, the key, and then similarly, these are the Phillips Van Vecten plots with respect to where here you define a property on terms of how far away it is from this boundary between ionic and covalent systems. And the idea that how far away you are from this hyperplane is exactly the same language one uses, for example, in support vector partitions. Uh, you have other kinds of methods where you define some parameters that you think are important, uh, and, and then you just cluster and see where they exist. And this, again, we, we, we do this all the time as a learning process. And, and this, of course, is for, it's very picturesque. It's a, it's a so-called Pettiford plot where Pettiford said, well, let me just label uh, elements. And this is on one side, one on this side and that side, but you label them not across back and forth, but up and down like a string when it's called Mendeleev string. And he's found a, uh, a beautiful, that, that uh, just arranging the data in a certain fashion can see lots of interesting patterns. But the interesting thing in all these cases is that um, it isn't so much what uh, you can learn from this, obviously, but what I, the question I that, that drives our research is, well, how do you know what the axes should be? Whether it be some chemical scale information, whether it's these two parameters versus something else. And in every one of these was done heuristically and empirically. And from the theory and experimental side, we then spent years trying to understand what Hume Rothery proposed 100 years ago. And it's just interesting. I just, this is a very small scale, but if you look at from the 1920s to the, the latter part of the 20th century, um, the databases that, by the way, we're using today in, in, in the ASM, a lot of these uh, public databases are really coming out of people like Pierre Villers and, 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 and Pearson. Um, just, and, and, uh, but the idea in all these cases is that 
there was a lot of theory behind it, but, but a lot of that theory was really based on some very smart people understanding the nuances. And what we are really doing in many cases is just uncovering the, the relationships in more and more detail. And, and I'm gonna show you some examples of how we spent a good deal of our time trying to understand what underlies these various classifications. But all of these issues gives us design rules and these design rules are telling us uh, guidance as to what it is that we want to do. In this case, the, the fundamental question we have about uh, what alloys can exist and why do they exist. So this is actually some work. When we first started this, uh, getting data in an organized way was hard. And by the way, you know, we, 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 we have taken for granted databases, especially coming out of computational methods as almost mainstay now. But I think what should be kept in mind is there's another set of data, which is actually produced by experiments. And, uh, and that's how we started off with. And, and uh, I talk about this work, which we published quite a long time ago uh, with Pierre Villers and Suichi Wada. And Suichi, of course, is in Japan, who was one of the pioneers for building uh, this kind of genre of work uh, in, at NIMS and that they, they came out of, he wasn't at NIMS, but he was at the University of Tokyo. But the point I want to make with this slide is what we did was, if we said, what are the characteristics that uh, govern the classification, in this case, of quaternary systems, and that was in, in our ternary, binary, ternary, and quaternary systems, we not just looked at you know basic data, but any we looked at different genres of data and looking at you know if you say atomic number, atomic number is just not one number. There's a whole bunch of information that goes underneath it. So similarly, for every genre of data or information that if, might influence a property, um, there there's a subset, a hierarchy of things. And so what we did at that time was um, we did it. This is before a lot of the machine learning tools were easily usable. We had to do it on our own by hand in some way, analytically, if you wish, um, and also come up with some intuitive concepts. And we did essentially what you would call today a combination of genetic programming methods and, and as well as understanding some of the theoretical issues. And we were able to produce these very, very strong classification maps and show uh, how and these scales here, by the way, uh, are numbers, I should say, are actually the result of a there's a, actually a complex arithmetic formula, uh, very similar to what you would see in a genetic programming exercise. And we've done this for various systems and shown how we can learn from how, as you go to higher and lower, or lower order components, uh, the, the certain parameters get more influence than others. So if I look back at when we did this work, um, I mean, the paper is dated 2008, but we started that much, much earlier. We were asking some, what, what I think are some very tough questions like, uh, you know, how does the characteristics of alloy development change based on the multiple components you put in? And, and, let, and, and to understand multi-component chemistry is really uh, a, a very big challenge in, in just even one property, let alone multi-scale properties. So we took this idea and, and over the years, we've then went further and, and, and this, this, you know, if you pass a number of years and we went back to collaborate with Pierre and, and, and Suichi and, and one of my, one of my better graduate students, so he, he did some very nice work. He's, his approach was to say, we have all these classical theories, all of these, let's, let's say all of them are right. We're not, no, we're not saying one is right better or the other is worse. And, and then we began to update the information from theoretical concepts and, and, uh, and say, how do all these different metrics interact with each other statistically? <laughs> and, and so, um, and as you know, uh, we have these classifications. In fact, textbooks will show this all the time and saying uh, the atoms of certain, if they have certain, if they have similar sizes, they can, they can be soluble for example, or they have similar valencies, they can, they can dissolve. If not, they, they, they don't. But then you have, though, then they'll, there's always a line somewhere in the textbook which will say this works up to a point, but after that it doesn't work. And so there's always exceptions to everything. So the idea is there's the, what we decided to do was to say, let's look at all of these issues together. And, and one way of doing it was a brute force approach, which is literally uh, to look at how different characteristics, and that's what we put here on, these, on this label on the x-axis here. And this, this part of this paper, by the way, was dealing with how to uh, actually explore with visualization techniques. And, I should point out that the visualization techniques that we take for granted today, um, uh, we don't even think about it, but there's actually some mathematics that underlies this. So we, we had, I had students in my group at the time who actually, their whole thesis was to deal with the mathematics of visualization as part of this. Now that today may be a, 
a passe topic, in, but it, 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 it's, a, it's these are very, very important issues. So apart from its, this is a visual, nice visual impact, there's a lot more here. But the idea is we were able to find groupings and similarities. And, and uh, this, we approached took a very descriptive statistics approach. But then we went further and we said, okay, how do we then relate what we see in the partitioning and the classification of data with, with um, known systems? And we did this approach where we looked at uh, what we call recursive partitioning, where we, we keep partitioning in, in smaller and smaller bits and try to see how refined we can find common structures and when do they break up. So that can be represented by this kind of uh, dendritic uh, or dendrogram type tree. Um, and so, um, let me see. Okay, so I, I just, this slide is animated. So if I look at a cluster like this, um, okay, the animation didn't work. Let me just get to this slide. What we then did was to say, uh, we went to the databases as our kind of ground truth. And now in this case, we were just looking at binary alloy systems with a certain stoichiometry AB2, but our ground truth is actually is, is grounded, is very well grounded because this wasn't computational work. This was actual experimental data that had been collected. And we began to look at the frequency of associations of certain crystal chemistries associated with certain crystal prototypes. As you know, the whole concept of homologous systems or crystal structure types is somewhat empirical. You say we have a sodium chloride look type structure or a cesium chloride type structure. And so if you look at the entire family of array of, of families of crystal structure types, which is different from the group theory foundation of this, you have a very complex interaction. And the way we did it was in a very simple way, if you think conceptually, which is how often do you see a part, a certain class of compounds or certain chemistry associated with a certain class of compounds? And that ratio, it can be described as a, as a probability in terms of a simple ratio. And then we basically say, if you keep adding information to it, at what point do you not learn anything more? And, and this this, this equation becomes an equation of the information addition that you can gain and at what point does it become zero. And that of course is, is actually a, one of the foundational kind of a very trite summary of the concept of information entropy. And, and the information entropy function really allows us to maximize the information that any variable or a parameter associates itself with a given compound. So we have all these characteristics associated with, with, with the chemistry, which ones play a role and if you don't have always a clear knowledge, we basically say, what is the statistical possibility of probability of that happening? And we, uh, and we, and the entropy function here has a, uh, is defined in this, um, uh, in this particular fashion, but it's a really counting exercise. And if we did that, um, um, we then could come up with a scale and, and we scaled all these uh, parameters based on an entropy function, where this entropy function was, uh, and, we, and it turned out that valence size and electrochemistry are one of the dominant parameters. We managed to screen that out. And then we could group all these compounds in binary compounds in, in a different kind of periodic table or a different kind of structure map. Uh, and, and the idea is that we can um, uh, look at different, and you can, we can develop crystal structure design rules which then we can, in a static picture, we see something like this, where we find the clusters that we know exist, but we were also able to find out systems that seemingly were similar on, on but when you look at the information entropy, what is the contribution and the actual connection that variable has to its stability, it can vary. And so we are now using these information entry maps and building it for multi-component systems as well to look at how the different scaling can actually happen. The other point that I we like to raise is, and this comes back to my the connectivity idea, is um, how are they connected? They may be connect, they may be far in terms of a stability because the parameters are all dealing with uh, thermodynamic stability. How do they relate with respect to crystal structure and and relate to group theory issues? So you can get some, and and again these red and blue dotted lines looks like a an airline route map is really connecting which compounds are connected to others just from symmetry perspective. And that involves essentially producing what's known as a Barninghouse diagram, but it basically looks at what's a group theory symmetry operations allow certain materials to be next to each other from a phase transformation point of view and which one's not. So the whole argument we were trying to make is you have different scales of information. You have crystallographic information, you have thermal and thermodynamic information, and we needed some neutral, we not a neutral, we needed a unified way of connecting them. And that's why we went into this in this information theory space to do that. Um, 
a lot. So with, with, so I just before I get to my next point, so all these uh, descriptors and so on that I've been talking about are defined based on um, what I call static information or scalar information, I should say, that you can extract and develop. And, and what I, I'm not doing justice at this point is behind these examples I'm giving you, we had a huge amount of study, which we still do actually, understanding how every descriptor plays a role in its influencing a given property of a, of a material, whether it be thermodynamic or to be a, a physical property, and, and, the, and, I, and carefully um, using the statistical and machine learning methods to understand what their contributions are. And each one of that is a massive exercise. And so we're now in a position where we, we, we don't, where our, we have a massive kind of foundational uh, tools to have a sense of confidence that uh, these descriptors can play a role. And once we have that, we can really go to town and go very, very fast on other materials. So, I, so for the first half of my talk, I just wanted to kind of give you um, where the concept of connectivity uh, is trying to connect different aspects of a material system and about one on crystal chemistry, one dealing with uh, crystal symmetry. Having said that, what we wanted, what, what's not embedded in here we, is that we wanted to also start putting in information um, and that is not just derived from uh, first principles or from, uh, from crystal from theoretical calculations, but they're looking at other ways that can capture the interaction between both. So for that, we we moved into, and this is something which we've now been doing for the last few years, and, and I thought I'll share some of this with you, is we're now going into more and more complex structures. And these this is an example. I'm going to give you some examples today, this afternoon, um, dealing with uh, MOF structure. So we, when we started, we started off with very, very simple uh, binary systems to uh, in, in inner metallics, which, which are complex in their own right. And we, over the years, we've gone into different classes of materials, uh, uh, multi-component oxides, spinels, perovskites, and, and so on, which we still work in. Uh, but in each one of them creates a different genre of, of concerns and, and challenges. So what we've done here in this example here that I want to talk about in the in the latter in the second part of my talk is to uh, say let's go to more complex structure. But now the the multi-scale asterisk has to deal with the fact that you know before we were just dealing with metallic bonding and saying you know if a valency, electronegativity, and size, all these things that we teach our undergraduates, how do they play a role? As we've shown, th there's a lot more uh, nuances and subtleties that you can pull out of seemingly well-established problems. Now imagine going to a system like MOF structures where you have multi-different kinds of bonding. You have metallic, you have covalent, you have hydrogen bonding, you have very, and of course, the, 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 the beautiful complexity of, of the geometry of the system itself. And so what we've done is um, we've asked a different kinds of question. Now, now we're saying, uh, and there are a lot of reasons why we're doing this, and there are a lot of different approaches. We went into a, an approach where, which has traditionally been in the organic uh, crystallography community. That is, and for those of you familiar with it, the kind of crystal engineering is the phrase they use. Uh, in fact, ACS has a whole journal called Crystal Engineering. Or if you look at uh, Acta Crist at any, any given issue, uh, all the papers on, on that deal with uh, organic crystallography do this, where they're trying to say, um, I have a, a, a molecule or a structure or a building unit that is the foundational part, which, which let's say this example, I'm using an organic system here as a case study. And then we say there is a, uh, what we map out an electron density effectively around that, uh, which is based on quantum mechanical principles. And then what we do is that you, you have each, uh, if you can imagine each building unit or what they call a pro molecule has this charge uh, distribution or, and, and based on how you, populate the wave functions. Then what you do is you partition and say, how do these different uh, components pack together to uh, produce the entire unit cell for that crystal structure? And so then that partitioning process is, is, is based on a statistical method. Actually, a statistical method, which is called Hirschfeld partitioning, which is actually borrowed from uh, the name Hirschfeld comes from the finance community and, the, and where uh, the idea of how is a stockholder is called, this, another term that's used is called a stockholder partitioning of how do you partition information um, in, 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 a given, in, a, in a given space. And um, so 
which is different from the Voronoi kind of partitioning, for example, where you kind of take these perpendicular bisectors and you, you in between a space. Here you're partitioning information that doesn't just capture geometrical information, but also captures the uh, uncertainty and the fuzziness of all the issues associated with quantum mechanical issues and how they two, the two of them relate. And then you get these um, this beautiful looking color codes, which refer to how, what the position is of the atom in, the, in a given, even within the structure to that, well, that partitioning surface. The, we have one is called the inner surface, the other one is called the outer surface, it's called DIDE. And these color codes refer to a, the curvature and the shape. And, and so it's like taking, uh, so basically what you're doing is you're taking a spherical shape and then you're squeezing it and, and in, a, in like a putty and, and, and it becomes, and the calculation of these shape factors becomes very complex, uh, which I'm not, I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not gonna get into the details of, but it gives us a lot of information over the years. And then we can take the shape information and project it down to into this two dimensional format, which is really a two dimensional projection of the, the frequency of, of how many, at any given uh, position of DI and DE, how much uh, different atoms contribute. So you, out of a diagram like this, you can pull out and tease out information, literally what the contribution of each pair of atoms is to the overall bonding surface. So it's a very powerful tool. Now we've modified that and, and taken that a little bit and moved it into the inorganic field. And this is some work which just came out a couple of years ago, uh, which was looking at MOF structures. And the question we were asking is, is this, and, and I, just, I just put this as a figurative part of the data. So if I have a whole set of MOF structures, and we actually started off by looking at now that we have databases, some experimental, some computational. Uh, and the question we were asking is, um, can we find the best material in terms of, uh, for a, a MOF structure to serve as a, uh, as a molecular sieve uh, or as a membrane? So the metric you're looking for is pore size. So one approach of how do you determine the pore size and look for the right pore channel in a very complex structure is not a trivial process. So you, know, you can look through diagrams and you know, beautiful pictures like this, and you can feed in all the information on bond angles and so on. And it's very, very hard, even from a machine learning point of view, to find out which orientation will give you the best, best geometry. What we then decided to do was we said, okay, instead of just looking at the bond information, we looked at the, at the, at the Hirschfeld, what's called the Hirschfeld surface projection, and began to apply what features in the Hirschfeld surface, we treated that histogram, that's what this is, it's a histogram, treated that as a descriptor space. So we converted this into a two-dimensional uh, vector, which served as a massive database for all these hundreds of compounds we began to look at. And then we projected that information, it becomes a high dimensional matrix, and we projected it into, two, uh, to a, into a lower dimensional space. And, there's, and the concept of manifold spaces and reductions are many, many techniques. Uh, the one we're using here is a, a, a technique called isomap algorithm. And, there, and, and one of the reasons for using it is um, it allows us to uh, map similarities between structures. And so what these nodes represent is the different classes, not the different, they represent the different crystal chemistries associated with the MOS structure. And, and it becomes a, a, what we call essentially an unsupervised learning process. So we say, you know, if, if, if um, I'm going back here, uh, if I have uh, this red uh, compound and yellow compound, or this red compound is connected to the uh, yellow compound here, I'm sorry, why is it connected? What, what, is, what is similar about them? Why are these two close together? So we began to, so right now we've converted what would normally be a massive tabular database of, of, of information that you see in crystallography into this manifold. And that becomes our new database. And, and then what we began to do is we, we, once we found, we go in and began to, in a piecewise fashion, go in and start looking at why certain things are far and which ones are close. And I'll give you some quick examples. Um, we found like we looked at these three and say, why are they close together? They don't have a similar space group. They don't have similar chemistries. And, and, and if you just look at these structures uh, like this, it's impossible to tell. And just even looking at these, these Hirschfeld surfaces by all of them is hard to tell. But it turns out that because we're able, to, we're, we're able to treat this as a data point, it turns out that these were the kind of the ones that were the layered compounds and they were able to, we were able to pick that up very, very quickly. Um, here's another example where we found these two connected and it turns out what happened was uh, they both have the, uh, a, a basic fundamental structural unit uh, of this complex 
a copper uh, complex that was embedded in both these systems. So we were able to relate that to, uh, and all of this in the context of how that influences surface area. So the, the, the idea of the what influences the, the size of pores in moss structures isn't just geometry, it's a complex relationship between uh, geometry and bonding, for example. So then another approach we took at is, um, and this is something we don't do enough in material science. So I think this is something we should do more of and the, the drug discovery community uses this. And I think, you know, with the COVID pandemic scenario is a good example. Where do you start looking? And, and in, the, in that process, one of the things I used to find the lead compound. The lead compound is a set, not lead compound. The lead compound is one that has the most probability of linking to other properties that we can serve as a template. So we've been able to find sorts of, and using this method, uh, find those compounds and, and tell us to accelerate the experimental or computational process. And, um, and so now then we were able to produce these maps where we can actually uh, identify very, very rapidly uh, new materials, which materials we had to best select to get our uh, maximum surface area for the problem. So, um, and then I just want to give this, this paper just came out uh, a few weeks ago, uh, where we're looking at this and applying this to perovskite structures. And we're interested in this for lots of reasons, for obvious reasons it's used in photovoltaics and so on. And what we've done is we've now uh, taught using um, a combination of both a variety of deep learning techniques, which is another, which is different from the manifold learning methods, but deep learning methods on these histograms and, um, and actually been able to predict uh, lattice parameters uh, and lattice parameters. And we picked this particular problem as a test case because what we were trying to argue is can we predict the properties of these materials from these uh, 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 distributions and the Hirschfeld surfaces? And it turns out we can, um, although I'm not showing it here, we've been able to do it for uh, other properties, uh, including uh, formation energy and so on. And we're able to do it very, very fast. That the, the, the one advantage uh, of, this, of this method is that uh, we can deal with multiple high component systems very, very fast. DFT is, of course, is our kind of, uh, you know, uh, best example to do things. But if you want to look at lots of compounds, we're able to do it. And, and we're showing that it has a very powerful tool to do that. So with that, let me just... Um, maybe use the last few minutes. I, I noticed in, 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 in looking at your seminar series that the, lat, the, the two preceding speakers um, were actually mathematicians. And I thought that was uh, nice that you're bringing different people in. And the topic that both of them dealing with, if, when I looked at it, was uh, the area of topological data analysis. So I this that's something we too have been working in, not as, a, as mathematicians, of course, but taking what that community has brought and apply it to, to material science problems. So um, I, I just show this dendrogram here, which is taken from a, a textbook on, on, on uh, uh, dimensionality reduction. And there's a potpourri of tools and techniques, but generally speaking, you know, we've been working in the statistical space of trying to understand distances between uh, points and distances between characteristics and in a high dimensional space. But we also now, I want to say, show how, how do we look at topology? And the question is, why do we care about it? And, I, and, I, and, and the reason we care about it, I always use this almost cartoon childlike example, is that uh, we know we, how, you, how you teach drawing is that if I, if I connect the dots here in the right sequence, I will get a fish. But how do I know that what the sequence is? And um, how do I know what I'm looking at? At which point does it, is it going to give me a real answer? And and to me, the connectivity issue here is it's very powerful. And in material science, especially multi-scale problems, is a cloud of data points that you don't know what shape it should be. So, and, and I'm going to give an example. We're doing this both on modeling problems as well as imaging problems. But I'll give the imaging one today because of the time, and also it's easier to visualize. Um, and, and any image is, is, has lots of features in it, and putting it all together is a high dimensional problem. Um, so an example I'm going to give is something that we work in. Another side of my life is I'm a microscopist, but now I'm sort of doing TEM work. I do atom probe work. I always like, for those of you not familiar, it's, a, it's a essentially a, a field emitting technique where you literally pull atoms off by pulse lasers or pulse voltage, el el electrical pulses. Uh, this is a picture of alumina. Uh, by the way, this is not a simulation. I, I, I always joke that I can now produce images that look almost as good as those of you who do uh, simulations, uh, but they admit, and we can actually get the mass spectra and we can actually get uh, spatial information. Uh, and a atom probe sits in this space in this the classical dilemma for materials characterization between high resolution versus high sensitivity. But um, so, the, but the data this is, is a, a reminder, um, atom probe across. Oh, sorry. Okay. 
Um, so the, the, okay, I missed something here. Okay, let me just, I meant to get to this slide. The, 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 the characteristics of, um, I'm using imaging as a, as, a, as, a, as a platform here, but this can be applied to all your multi-scale problems, uh, which is you have large volume, you have noisy data sets, your variables, whether they be experimental or computational are, are large. And, and to me, this is the challenge in multi-scale characterization. And what we're trying to do is to get, we have, we don't know where the data should sit. That can be a spatial thing in, in, in imaging or where does it sit in the property space? So I see this, these two boxes as our basic overall challenge. And the interesting thing about Atom Probe is that you get images that look random, but this is a crystalline material. So the question is, where are the clusters that actually exist, especially when you're looking at five, 10 atom clusters and five atom clusters. So we've been approaching it from various different methods and one approach that we've used, and we've done it for different approaches, but the one I'm gonna talk about quickly today to, to, is, is, this, is the use of uh, these topological methods. And, I, and it's, this table is there, but I just wanna point out the main advantage here is that you don't need any model. We don't make any assumptions about the nature of the data. And it has a lot of mathematical characteristics, which your prior two speakers that you had in the previous weeks uh, are, are know much more about. But we've taken that approach and applied it to, to a, a, a question here, which is this. Um, all of you can look at this ring of dots and you can say, aha, that's a ring. Uh, but your, what your eye is really doing is looking at these dots and automatically figuring out every permutation combinations to say, aha, this is the most likely uh, shape it should be. So the same argument can be applied here. And therefore the, the topological data analysis tool really is looking for massive permutation and combinations of connections in, 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 the, in the math community and the computer science community have now uh, evolved that to the point that we can apply them as tools. And so um, then what we're doing here is we then look at the persistence and that's where the word comes in of these connections. So if I have these dots and what we do is we, the, each dot represents has a sphere of influence. And if we say, how do these spheres of influence connect with each other and which ones connect the most and how long do they last uh, is really a way of understanding what is going, what, what the shape factors are and where the edges are. So we've done that and applied it to a variety of problems. Uh, this is a problem where we're looking at um, uh, in atom probe images where we're looking at features which, are, which involve coherent interfaces. And these, you know, you see a lot of papers showing these very beautiful pictures, but what people don't understand, have to realize is I can take that same picture and show it five different ways or four different ways. And, and, and unless you do the statistics like we're doing, you won't be to really, you won't really know what the shape of that interface is and what the chemistry is. And which is very, very critical. In this case, we're looking at uh, nickel-based superalloys and trying to understand quantitatively, and that's the operative word, quantitative analysis of what the interface structure and chemistry is. Here's an example, as you can see, there's a, a lot of different studies we have to do where we're actually looking at um, an oxide silicon interface and trying to understand the width of that solid silicon oxide interface. And this was actually, uh, and, and just for those of you not familiar with Atom Probe, but these are picometer level uh, scales which, is, which, you, which you cannot get in a high resolution TEM. This is the imaging version of the spectrum, uh, which is all derived from machine learning based analysis. And, uh, and then we actually compared this with molecular dynamics uh, using reactive force fields and showed that what they're doing at the molecular scale from the modeling point of view actually matches this. And all of this is based on applying these TDA methods to uh, understand the connectivity of chemistry and structure. And uh, more recently, we're able to scale that up and, and look at uh, nanoscale features in, in, in hidden data. In this case, uh, we're looking at uh, clusters of scandium atoms in an aluminum matrix where you, and this picture here actually contains about uh, 330 million, or sorry, about 100 million points of atoms. And uh, we're using these techniques of how do you determine an edge by looking at connections using these techniques called modulary optimization. But the idea is this is, is how do you define a community of points when you have a lot of noisy information in the background? And all this comes out of these TDA methods. So I just wanna point out this connectivity issue we're applying to imaging problems as well. So let me just end, uh, and I hope I'm not too over time on this, is, um, you know, what, if, if you want to do multi-scale problems uh, and you want to use data, I, I, I just kind of highlighted some of my thoughts of where I think 
where the challenges are, uh, which is outlined in red, and, and where what the function of these various um, AI methods can play a role. Uh, just as a, as a uh, bit, bit of entertainment, but I think it's very serious entertainment, on the right-hand side is another MGI. Many people think MGI refers to the Materials Genome Initiative. I just want to point out that we, we shouldn't live in a bubble. There, the biologists have called another, have, they have their own program called the Mouse Genome Initiative. And the mouse, as you know, is the, is the kind of the workhorse for biological research. The reason I show this is for, for the simple fact that if you notice what they market and what they're selling here in their, in their, in their symbolism isn't just saying, I want to look at a lot of mice uh, or I want to letter H on idea. I want to understand the connections between the mouse and how it serves as a model system for other, other species. And more importantly, how does the information at the molecular scale actually relate to the experiments we do at the system scale? And there's another side of my life where we do work with biologists, and so that's I won't talk about that today. But the, the, the but the whole idea of multi-scale modeling is universal in so many fields, uh, and I think this gives us a chance to work with different folks. So I hope this was a, you know, I covered a lot of fuck very fast, but I hope this is something that may interest you, and um, get to know more of you if you're interested to talk more in the future. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Krishna. This was a really very interesting talk, uh, you know, exciting examples, uh, great concepts in here. So, yeah, let, let's go ahead with questions. Yeah, I have a question. Can I? Uh, can I? Oh, yeah, you should. <laughs> so go ahead, Wei. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, that's a great talk, uh, Krishna. So actually, uh, yeah, I found that we have many similar interests. Uh, so for example, this APT uh, data set, uh, so we also try to look at APT data for botai component systems. We actually try to look for uh, the local structures from APT data. I think one major issue is that uh, a large fraction of the atoms are missing from from the okay data. yes so how did I, how do you do it? <laughs> I, I, the, the, okay, there, there's. Um, that's another, that's another seminar I want to give you, I can give you, which is we started off by saying, how do you fill in the missing atoms? So we spend, we, and we've, uh, and, and we're not, I'm not claiming we're the only group that did it, but we, that our, our group, uh, Simon Ringer's group in Australia and all of his group moved to, Austria, to, to Oxford. So we've been kind of, uh, as friends, been com competing in this space for a long time and their approach, and, and we're all looking at this from different perspectives. So the, 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 but the, the approach I've taken is treat this as a machine learning problem, as opposed to I have a geometry and I have classical methods to, to organize and reconstruct data. So, and, and, I, and we are able to do that. So we can reconstruct, um, I, we can reconstruct the crystal structure of, well, of known crystal structures. Um, and it gives us an accuracy of that, that's there. And it also, we're able to re understand reconstruction with respect to orientation and crystallography. So the, the, but we weren't using topological data analysis. We were using a whole host, actually other dimensionality reduction methods, but it also required us to put in data that goes beyond the image. What the, the, the background noise, which has background issue, which I didn't mention here too much is that we actually keep a track of every experiment that we do. So when you take a picture, the, the atom probe actually has a lot of bells and whistles that people don't realize. And unfortunately, the thing is so, I, we were the, one of the early groups having an atom probe. So I, I, I actually operated on the first generation of atom probes that came out commercially. And so um, there was a good news, bad news. The good news was we were, we were only the third university group at the time doing this. The bad news was you have an instrument that you literally have to marry and, and, and live with day, 24 hours a day to nurse information out of. So we really understood all the nu nuances about the machine. Uh, now the average user doesn't have to, which is, I don't like, but I, so, but we, act, so when we, we actually use our own software, we don't use the commercial software that they come with the machine anymore. But your answer to your question is, we know how to do with the missing data question. Uh, we account for it in terms of your interpretation. Um, and uh, and I, we operate on the, on the assumption, even if you, I have now the newest generation, but I still don't trust you know, they'll tell me, oh, Krishna, you got this. We collect 80% of the data. I say, well, let's assume I don't. <laughs> How do I interpret the material science? So in answer to your question, we deal with that too. So that, that wasn't talked about, but the, but if, the Adam Pro is very bad at determining shape. And, and if you look at all the people doing, looking at shape, what people are doing is they're doing TEM work, 
Then they take the same sample, put it in the atom probe, and then they do this correlative microscopy. Very elegant, very requires another million dollar piece of equipment just to move a sample from one instrument to the other. Uh, so my poor man's approach was, since I don't have that, can I mathematically extract shape? And, and that's what got us into this. So anyway, yes. long answer to your question, but yeah, if you're interested, yeah, let's, let's talk more, absolutely. Yeah, Yusu, you had a question then, Yang Sun. Yeah, sure, yeah. So no, I mean, thank you for the talk. I mean, I, I, I work in geometric and topological data analysis. So really <laughs> cool oh, to see yeah. you mention that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you mentioned this, uh, uh, you know, from the point clouds growing this filtration to, to uh, capture the uh, topology. Mm -hmm. I mean, how is that essentially eventually used in your um, analyzing the APT uh, data or? Yeah, mm -hmm. Very good question. Um, we're using it a number of ways. Uh, one way is if you look at pictures on uh, precipitates in atom probe, for example, or pictures, how sharp is the edge? And in, in, in scattering techniques like electron microscopy, X-ray diffraction, the interface scattering shows up very strongly. The in atom probe is the inverse. The moment you have an interface, the, the, the image looks fuzzy. And so we're, we're in this dichotomy where you have a tool which makes the, the things you're interested in by definition look fuzzy because the evaporation mechanisms at an interface are far more dynamic and far more uncertain. So the positions get diffuse. So one of the things we're, what we're trying to do is to say, uh, how sharp is that interface? The second place we use it when that, and I know I went through this very fast, but when I came up with these profiles of compositional profiles, and I'm gonna be very candid about this, there's lots of people doing microscopy, but how many papers actually quantitatively measure atom by atom what that profile is, and then you do some interpretation. So the whole idea was if we're going to really take advantage of all the people doing modeling, atomistic modeling on diffusion and interface issues, and we have a tool which on principle gets us information at the atomic level, there was a huge gap that we were, we had a we had a powerful tool. It's like sending a man to the moon and just to tell him it's got craters. It is not, you're, you're, you're missing all the other things you can get with it. So the missing link from our, my perspective was the mathematics. So if you put the mathematics in there and then we sit down and actually do that with the modeling. So that is the other area that I see is very valuable. The one that I did not mention, which is work that we're right now in the process of writing up and publishing is taking all this and now applying this not to imaging data, but to property data. So we are now finding where the, the point cloud now is the point cloud of all the descriptors I was talking about earlier. And now we're finding classifications of crystal structure that people hadn't seen before. So that's a separate talk, but that's one where we, it's taken me 10 years to get to that point. But uh, we started off with imaging because you can interpret the, the big challenge for, uh, for me, I'm not a, as, as, a, as in using these methods is what does it mean? I mean, the TDA is so elegant, it's beautiful. But then I, every time I say, okay, how does that, how do we interpret it as a material scientist? It became a very challenging problem. So we started off with imaging. In fact, most of the work on TDA on, in material science tend to be on the imaging side or, or, or picture side. It could be porosity of a moth structure, or uh, it could be the porosity in a mesoscale structure. People are applying that for those kinds of systems um, or looking at amorphous structures where you do not have a periodicity. You know, and if you're looking for a pattern, I mean, very nice work that you know, the Japanese have done where they're looking at what short, deals with short range order, medium range order versus a, a liquid structure in glass. Um, but but that's, it's hard to do that for other problems. And, and, and so we've, we've found a way to do that. And, and that's, good. that's actually something we're working on. We're actually working on. Yeah, I mean, today outside the material science actually has been used for high dimensional data. Yes, oh yes, including absolutely. Including time series yeah. data, yeah. I think, I mean, in fact, it's, that's it's probably to material science that's still very, you know, it's a starting stage, which is really exciting, so, yeah. Well, the, the, you know, the, I have to say that what fascinated me about the CDA was, its application, social science data, uh, geography, uh, other kinds of, and I always was thinking, how can we, it, the questions they're asking are multi-scale questions. And how do we take those multi-scale questions and apply it to us? That was not a trivial, you know, it's, it's tantalizingly close, but when you get to the details, it was very, very hard. So this is our method to, to get in. Okay, that's cool, thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
Yang Sun, or did you have a question earlier? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, hi. Uh, thank you for your talk, Krishna. So, yeah. I actually have a quick uh, follow-up question uh, with, Ch with, with uh, APT data. So, I'm wondering that like, you mentioned the distance between different atoms. So, I'm wondering, like, what if the atom, uh, you know, the, posi the location of the atom is not accurately married? Then, usually, you know, what kind of distance do you, do you use to adjust for that measurement error? Right, so there, there's, okay, I, I, let me try to answer your question this way. I will never make the claim that we are ever going to get a perfect position of that atom alone. It's not easy to do. We have done it. In fact, it took me an, uh, one student an entire PhD just to uh, precisely position a tungsten atom in a BCC crystal. That and 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 get uncertainty. So we we and that wasn't done using and that was done by a combination of techniques. So we, we so it's it is possible to do that. We have been able to do uh, very accurately uh, get positions. Uh, do it kind of a navigational approach where you you know one orientation, you know another orientation. You know where ideally you want a third orientation. So you want to position yourself and say where could this position be. So we if you look at if you look at an atom probe tip. It's, it's a hemisphere in the ideal scenario. So what we're trying to do is position ourselves as, an, as, a, as a kind of a geographical navigational issue. How many coordinate positions do you need to look at in order to position the atom at a given point? So we have done that. So that's the other approach. But now the, the, the approach of looking at the shape is, is, a, is a slightly different question where we're saying statistically, what is the probability that the atoms are actually connected? So in other words, we are, so of course we're picking problems where we have some understanding of the material science. So if I say, I understand how the precipitate nucleation and growth process is in a given system, then I have a pretty good knowledge of potential shape, what the diffusion could be and so on. And, um, and then the, the last case example I gave you, which was that buried system, we, that's where we got into this thing called modularity optimization methods, which is uh, allows us, is, if that's borrowed actually from, the, from uh, the social science field where they're looking for commonalities of communities. And so when does one atom on one side, when you connect it, get you outside onto another community that it shouldn't be there. And, and that process of searching that is what the TDA allows us to do. And, 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 and then the persistence issue comes in because if it, if, if, if it's, if it, if it persists long enough, we have a greater faith in it. That, that's a, it's a very crude statement to make, but that's what it is. Even, even, even my information entropy analysis was, if it looks like a duck, it must be a duck. Meaning how often does this crystal structure look like that crystal structure in terms of the population? And if I hit that probability function, then it does that. And it, and it doesn't, it looks like a very simple function, but if you think about it, our cell phones operate that. If the Shannon entropy met function, which simply says, how if I dial a number, it goes into ether space, but I can call you and not use you. That makes it, it there's, it's just the probability issue that based on that information entropy. So I, it is, there is an uncertainty. That's why we're applying this with caution, depending on the problem. In some cases, we're actually about saying the image is now has a boundary of, of confusion. And this is what it is. And I'll be very honest, not every microscopist cares. If it looks good, they'll say it solves my problem and go on. But if you want to understand that uncertainty, and I would argue that if you're trying to determine a problem where you know a nanoscale change profile and diffusion is occurring or sub nanoscale is occurring, we have to have some uncertainty measures in there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if there is time, I would have one more quick question also. Krishna? Yeah. 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 And, and that was on slide 18. Uh, you had uh, you know, shown these different uh, metal and also, I think, sulfide competition, uh, compositions, alloy and sulfide composition. There were like three labels on the, on the corners, like EC, VE, and yeah. S. What, what did these, uh, what were these oh, yeah. corners? Okay, I apologize. Oh, v is valency. E uh -huh. refers to ultra negativity and S uh, is size. So this is almost like, you know, I, I picked that because if you look at every textbook, that's what we say, you know, if the size of the atoms are, are similar and the valencies are similar, ultra negativity is similar, these, al these al atoms should get together and, 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 and be soluble. That's a very kind of first order approach to teach, teach students. Oh, yeah. that and, and that actually, yeah, that, that it, makes it basically sense. works. But 
it, it, then you get down in, into the weeds, it, it doesn't, it, it starts breaking down. So the, the purpose of showing that map is to say, we do not have clear clusters, even though we acknowledge these as, oh, these are electron valence, we call them valence compounds. We say all these compounds are driven by the fact that they have common valence. Well, yes, up to a point, but then they don't. <laughs> and then, then, then why is it this one not? And that's what keeps us employed as scientists. We sit there and study it, we, we do our calculation, we do all kinds of things. So the idea here is in fact, is, is to use this information entropy way as, because the reason I'm, I, I put this in is because um, we now have lots more data than when I started with, okay? By, by, by today's standards, I mean, that, that, that diagram I showed you, I sent it to about three journals before anybody would even say, because the, the reviewers always say, who cares? I never got, I got papers rejected, not because they, I did anything wrong. They simply said, who cares? You know, it was like, if I want a data, I'll go get the data. Or if I want to calculate, I'll go calculate. But I think this kind of approach, if we can now, in fact, I was telling this to one of my students the other day, we have all these databases out there. We have electronic structure databases and all these other things. We can just dump that in here and boom, you can see, we'll see far, far more interesting patterns by doing this. So, um, so that, that was the answer. A long answer to your question, but that, that's what the labels were. Uh, yeah, it seems actually, I think it's very, it's great criteria because, you know, if one, I mean, starts putting in physical information into the data and models, it is really important to, to first cover fundamental relationships and, and then maybe refine from there. I mean, otherwise maybe it becomes black box, right? Yes. Uh, so the argument I see here is where I, I'm, I was trying to propose if we use this is to say, we see something that you expect to see, then you say, fine, I, I, you can say I have success. My argument is if you see something that, don't, that looks different, that forces you to think about what could be the cause of that. So I see this both as a way to confirm what you know, but also to decide what you need to look at. And, and we can layer, you know, the, the, the information on that map that I showed, we're only looking at phase stability. We're not looking at anything else. Imagine we put property data on top of that and you put layers and layers. So that you create, so your multi-scale data, instead of just being the data being the, the, the plane, you, you make that plane a manifold, which itself is high dimensional. And then you add layers and layers of, of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there any other questions? Well, great then. Okay. Um, so, well, so thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time out. I know you have a all of you have a safe and good holiday, and I know time is busy for you. To sit down and listen to me for an hour, and and I, I genuinely I I know Henry too, so it's nice. But I would really like to you know please feel free to connect and. If we can build collaborations and do stuff together, uh, I would love to. And I think that's the biggest, I think, joy I have getting to meet people like yourself and appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for you. giving us the talk. I mean, it's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And have a good holiday, too. All right. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank for you. Now. Bye.